Um, what I do know about law enforcement is that we hate being told what to do. And as executive management, you guys hate being told what to do and really like telling other people what to do. So to me, research often feels like it's somebody coming in, an outsider coming in and telling you what to do, but it's actually, what I see it as, is information that we could incorporate into our strategy for policing. So what I'm gonna tell you is both the story of how I was introduced to evidence-based policing and then how we integrated it into the Sacramento Police Department. Where we were at in January of this last year is just like every other agency across the nation is we were facing budget cuts and layoffs. They were looking at reducing our staffing by 80 police officers. Sacramento is about 500,000 people um, at night. We get about a million population that comes in during the day. And our police, we have about 720 sworn and only about 200 civilians. So we are very understaffed as it is. And then we were faced with cutting 80 more officers. Um, so we were trying to figure out a way to become more effective and more efficient because we knew that we were going to probably cut a lot of our specialized units. Another issue that came with that is a morale issue is the officers were looking at if we cut 80 officers from our agency, we're going to lose all our specialized units. There's going to be stagnation. And what that meant for my management is although they were aligned with us as far as not wanting to let staff go, you still get that us versus them mentality. So when you're trying to move your agency into evidence-based policing or anything new, you get that pushback from the officers of, you're not gonna tell me what to do. I know what's the best for my beat. I know how to be a police officer because I've been on for all of three years. <laughs> you know how that works. Um, and then our ComStat process, just that's why I was asking James who, who the secret agency was that had the best ComStat because our ComStat is ineffective and dry and everybody's eyes glaze over. And for the last year, my chief has been asking for a new ComStat, a new process, something more dynamic, something where we were really developing our issues. So the reason we started looking into the study, for me, just to give you a little bit of background, about two years ago, I met Chief Beerman. And so I was inculcated into the evidence-based policing, I don't even know what you call it, cult, uh, maybe. Yeah. Is that <laughs> And I know for those of you that are probably here, you've been, it's, you, once you get into the cult, they just keep introducing you to their fellow membership until you're a believer, <laughs> right? So as I say, there's, there's days where, um, because it's the matrix, I equate it to the red, red pill, blue pill, like I should have taken the blue pill. I, I was a happy cop. I like to arrest people, take them to jail, kick in doors, drive. I was happy. <laughs> I did not know there was policing research out there and, that was, and there was potentially a, a different avenue for policing. But once I took the red pill and had the information, my whole life changed. So Chief Beerman introduced me to Cynthia Lum, presentation there. I did a Fulbright scholarship over with the London Metropolitan Police Service and Chief Beerman helped set me up with Larry Sherman over at Cambridge and furthered my education in evidence-based policing. And so, as I like to say, I became a believer and I'm like an evangelist. Everybody who will listen to me within my agency listens to me about evidence-based policing. I leave quotes on their doors. I leave articles underneath. <laughs> they run away from me now, so it's great. Uh, I figure one of these days I'm gonna be lynched. So, the reason for our study is my executive management decided that this was a direction that we were going to go. And so they thought by introducing a study, we could kind of lay the foundation for crime analysis, research, statistics, et cetera, based on this study. Because we all know that as officers, we don't like new things and we like them to be proved. So we thought if we only introduce it into a small part of our city, um, two districts out of our six districts, and we didn't go citywide with it at first, and we promised them that we wouldn't use hotspotting unless it actually worked, that it would open their minds to evidence-based policing. Um, and also, as Dr. Weisberg said, we wanted to look at something that was effective within Sacramento. So we looked at all the studies that were out there, and as you've seen before, you know, there's nine studies showing that it's hotspotting is effective. And we also looked, and I forgot to mention that I was introduced to Chris Coper and the Coper curve, the infamous Coper curve, um, and we decided that we were going to use that study as the basis of our hotspotting study. So when we created the study, we were gonna direct officers to the hotspots for 12 to 16 minutes and just use high, high visibility to see if that reduced crime and calls for service. 
what we did for my chiefs and executive management is we wanted to show them that these are our hot spots, both control and treatment, and the density map is where the officers were engaging in their proactivity. So we kind of want to show that officers normally go based on their experience of, I know my beat, I know where crime's occurring. Not to discredit them, but just to kind of show that they're not always right, that experience isn't always um, perfect, that you want to use the research along with your experience. So the study design, when we get through the study, you're probably going to think, oh, this is really easy. It sounds so simple. Because when I presented it at CompStat, with eyes glazed over, um, <laughs> it sounds really easy, and the results sound really easy. And I just want to tell you it was really hard. Because one, none of us knew what we were doing. We were guided by Dr. Weisbird and Cynthia and Cody. Where's Cody? Where's my shout out? There he is. Thank you for all your stats. Um, but it was a process of kind of figuring out what question we wanted to answer, how we were going to answer that question, and how we were going to design the study. So by only using two districts, we were reduced as to how many hotspots we came up with, and we ended up with 42. And since we had such a small sample size, we paired up those hotspots to create more statistical power, um, and we paired them up based on their geography and their crime. And once the, we made the pairings, then one was randomly assigned to control or treatment. Um, the study ran for 90 days, and we had the officers put themselves, our call sign was a D1 hot, which believe me, when you, I don't know about you guys, but the hotspot jokes were just abound. I mean, it was, do you know where your hotspot is? Have you checked your hotspot? My favorite one was, we have wagons that take the drunks to jail, was my wagon's too big for a hotspot which I'm like, oh, that's just bordering on inappropriate. Um, so they were told to go out every shift, and what we did is we made it a high priority. So it wasn't just between calls for service. It was actually they were told that they needed to get to every hot spot within their district every two hours or so. And we also randomized the order of hot spots they went to. So if you had three hot spots in your district, you might do 321, 321, 321, throughout your shift, and the next day it might be three, uh, three, two, or three, one, two, and then the next day, one, two, three. So it was changed up every day, and that was also um, computer generated. So they weren't choosing when to go to the hots, or which hotspots to go to and when. They were basically told, this is the one you're going to next. And we gave them suggestions for proactivity when they were out there, but we were baby stepping this. We just actually wanted them to physically go to the hot spot, put themselves out on the hot spot, and be visible. So a lot of them, um, one of the downfalls that we ran into is they thought we were just telling them to go sit there, which wasn't the case, and I kept telling them they're just not listening, but at that point they didn't care. Once again, these are treated and non-treated hot spots. The only people that knew where the control areas were were the crime analysis unit. We didn't release it outside of our unit, so the officers had no idea where, the, where these control areas were. These were the total number of visits, and we tracked on a weekly basis how many visits they made, so that way the captain of uh, the area captain could reinforce if the numbers started dropping to kind of just push them to keep going out to the hot spots. And our results after 90 days of doing this on a daily basis from 9 o'clock in the morning till 1 in the evening was this. We got a 7.7% reduction in calls for service in our treated areas. The non-treated areas increased by 10.9%. And then for part one crimes, the treated areas were decreased by 25%. That's a 25% drop in part one crimes. And our untreated areas, crime increased by 27.4%. So this is the part, if you can't tell, this balloons and confetti should come down and there should be like a theme, like the crescendo of the music <laughs> that goes, yay! Um, because for me, uh, my, poor, <laughs> my poor analysts had to deal with me coming in and asking about the numbers. And there was one day where my poor analyst said, you know, they spent... And he gave some inordinate number amount of time at the hotspots because the other thing I wanted to do was co uh, cost-benefit analysis. And I stood there, and I don't, if you can't tell from my personality, I get very passionate about things. And, I'm, and we have a small building. I'm like, you're wrong. And he's like, no. And he's very clear on his numbers. I'm like, you are wrong. You're wrong. I'm like, you're wrong. And I'm like ready to have a panic attack. And I'm like, you did something. I'm like, there's something wrong. 
And in my head, I'm thinking, Jason's never wrong. He's so, he's so good with his statistics. And I'm like, it's seconds. It's seconds. You're using seconds. And he's like, it's minutes. I'm like, oh, thank God. Because he was telling me that we were like out there like 50,000 hours already. And I was like, that cannot be right. They're never going to implement a program where we're out there spending you know, millions of dollars on hotspotting. So I get very, it was very important for me on a, per like I said, I'm an evangelist. I'm a convert. It was important for me that this study work, not to prove that I was right, even though I love it when I'm right. It was important to me because this was our first foray into evidence-based policing. And that's why we chose the hotspot study because it was something that was already proven to have been effective. So I knew most, our most likely outcome would be that it was effective. And hopefully that was where I was gonna win over the officers and get them to open their minds to evidence-based policing. These are our results again, and Cody, another shout out for him, did all, ran all our statistics for us. And he did a one-tailed test. And the, the statistical part of it, if you guys have questions, you're gonna have to ask Cody. I'm a practitioner, not a researcher. But our p-values <coughs> made it statistically significant. As you can see, they were 0 0.0255 for part one and then 0 0.405 for calls for service which means in layman's terms, and this is how I explained it to my management, that we, we could predict with 95% accuracy that our treatment of the hot spotting based on the COPA curve was the effect for reducing crime and calls for service rather than it just being by pure chance. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Back to that last slide. Sure. How do you know your treatment didn't take resources away from those areas where crime increased? It looks like it's a swap that's a great question and how I know that because every single question that the officers had which were just along the same lines as yours we tried to research so we looked back at our staffing levels from 2010 to 2011 same exact staffing levels considering who was out light duty or officers that were on vacation so we had the same amount of officers working 2010 to 2011 then we looked at how many hours they spent both in the treatment and non-treatment areas and when you looked at 2010 compared to 2011, we actually spent more time policing those non-treatment areas than we did in 2010, and crime still went up. So to me, what it says, it wasn't that we were policing more, it's the type of policing. Because we were still there more often, and crime was still going up. So it's the type of policing that we were doing. So that was a great question. Um, and this is where, my next slide, we were trying to answer a lot of these questions because we know that officers, but what if everything to death? So one of the first ones was, but what if our response times to calls for service increases? And we all know that doesn't mean anything when trying to reduce crime, but it's always a concern to your community members, your city council, and officers. So we compared their response times 2010 to 2011 and showed that there was a minor increase in one district by 10 seconds um, for priority two, three, four, and five calls for service. But in the other district, we actually reduced our time, our response times for calls for service. Yeah. What happened in those areas that officers were spending time in on self-initiated activities that were not on spot? Yeah. So that's where, so our proactivity, what we looked at next, because they, they felt if I'm being pulled over here for hot spotting, I'm not going to be able to do other proactivity in other areas. And we showed their proactivity did not go down in any other areas. Compared 2010 to 11 again, their proactivity actually increased, and we did two charts. I didn't inundate you guys with a lot of charts, but we have all the charts available of everything we looked at for the officers. So we had two charts. One showed their um, proactivity, including the D1 hot, and then their proactivity taking out the D1 hot. And they had an increase, it was a small, but 12% that they increased their proactivity. You had several in um, that initial slide that identified the hot spots. Mm -hmm several areas where the density of their self-initiated activity right. was higher. Why were they spending so much time? I think that's because, and I don't know about other police agencies, but we reward statistics. So, and this is just a theory, is I think they go to their fishing ponds where they could get easy statistics, whether it's citations, subject stops, a little bit of dope or what have you, and they go fish in those fishing ponds because it's really easy to get. It might not be your major crimes, but it pads their statistics. Yeah, and that's something we're looking at too. I know Jeff, you're talking about like the community engagement. Engagement. 
is trying to figure out a different reward system to really get them to focus on hotspots rather than our normal statistics of arrests or guns or dope or what have you. Um, so our proactivity, we looked at traffic stops, subject stops, um, their self-initiated um, calls for service that they created, and we didn't show a decrease anywhere except subject stops. In the two districts that they were hot spotting in, there were slight decreases in their sub subject stops, but there was also decreases of the same magnitude in two other districts. <coughs> so you can't necessarily say it was hot spotting alone that caused the decrease in the subject stops. It could be for a myriad of reasons. And then also displacement. Displacement, we looked at because the officers would argue that if I'm here, of course, if, I'm, if a cop's here, then crime's just going to go around the corner. And so what we did is we, we looked at the buffer zones around our treatment and non-treatment areas. And this was not scientific by any means. This was kind of us just comparing to, to give the feedback to the officers. But we only showed a, um, a slight increase in two areas for part one crimes and three areas for calls for service. But in one of those areas, there is a Target store that was built that wasn't there in 2010. So we actually think it was probably just an increase in one area for part one crimes and two for calls for service. Some of our obstacles that we came upon during the research study was deeply embedded culture. Our officers, and I know Dr. Weisberg just talked about, I explained to you in two minutes what a randomized control trial is and you should have an understanding of why it works and how it proves, um, how, how science is able to prove what it's saying. And I don't, I, Cody and I had a conversation because I asked him, I said, am I explaining this wrong? <laughs> because I'm explaining it and they still would come back with, well, you can manipulate statistics however you want. And I would try, I'm, I'm not manipulating statistics. This is a 90 day study, there are set parameters, it's a research design and I was talking to Chief Beerman, I equate it to that Peruvian study where they went to try to get the Peruvians to boil their drinking water and the Peruvians sat there and said, well, if I can't survive in water, then a germ can't survive in water. It was the same kind of argument is, well, I don't think you're right because I don't think you're right. And, I'm, and I was baffled on how to get around that thinking because it's very difficult for me to explain a randomized control trial over and over again and have people think, well, I just think you're wrong. That's your argument, is you just think that I'm wrong. But, all right. So um, my, <laughs> my biggest thing was trying to get their buy-in with the evaluation. That wouldn't you, rather, wouldn't you rather it be that instead of Renee coming up with some newfangled thing for you guys to do, wouldn't you rather me run a study to show if it's effective? And in the end, if I promise you we won't use it if it's not effective, wouldn't you rather that? And me just saying, oh, I'm trying to get promoted, so here's my new program, and you all have to do it. Because we all know that's what all the officers believe. Um, so, and I'd still get the comments of, we know that we're tied into this, it doesn't matter how it turns out, et cetera, but I'm slowly winning them over one by one. And then the other obstacle I had, and this was more for my management, is them not using it as a party trick. And this is no diss to my management whatsoever. Gosh, I sound like a 16 year old right there. Um, because they, I have very good management. I think it's just hard because management's pulled in so many different directions that it tends to end up being a party trick because right now we're looking at budget cuts. So they're trying to go to our city council and go to the media and say, look, we're innovative, we're special, we're different. You need to keep our cops because we're hotspot policing. So that's the part my fear is, is we're so focused on trying to reorganize and trying to hang on to our cops that we forget that this is a whole philosophy that our agency should be following and that we need to develop strategies if we really want to implement it throughout our agency. The lessons that I learned um, trying to develop a study with the guidance of GMU was you have, to, you have to know your systems really well. So for us, one of the first problems we had is when we were mapping our calls for service, they didn't map to an actual street segment. So the first time we ran it through, there was 55,000 calls for service that were just in the air. They were, we didn't know where they were. And what we found is that they were mapping to the actual property, that we had to figure out a way to pull the dot from the property down onto the street segment so it could tell us where all the street segments were in the city. So just small things like that. That's why I say it sounds so simple, but when, you, when we were trying to design the study, there was a lot of these troubleshooting things that we kind of had to figure out our systems and figure out how to, how to change what we were doing. I should have personally gone out to the hotspots 
and I should have trained my analysts more on evidence-based policing and the hotspot studies. And it wasn't any major errors. It was more things like once the study was underway, there was a couple of our hotspots that I was like, oh, that probably we should have probably not had that one in there because the, the way the street segment was and the kind of you know cr kind of crime that was there probably shouldn't have been included. It's one of those things that wasn't disastrous to the study. I think we probably could have had better effects if certain ones weren't in there. And that's my fault. Um, we were trying to get it up and running and get going on this thing. So looking back, I would have trained a lot more before we went out. Um, I would have also issued this study from the Office of the Chief. So crime analysis in my unit is out of the Office of the Chief, but it was myself and my team going to roll calls to do the training and to implement the whole study. And what happened is you, we got a lot of pushback from the officers and then other sergeants. Um, there's a couple emails I could show you where my biggest concern was, hey, we're having some um, problems in the first week of the study. And I'm a very direct person, so my email was very direct. So my whole team, there was a day where they came in and they're like, oh, I want to hear about the email. I'm like, are you serious? They're like, oh, we're hearing about the email. And I said, okay, let me read you the email in the tone that I meant it. And I read it in my tone. I said, no, let me read you my email in the tone that they heard it. And then I read it again. They're like, oh, that's funny. And I'm like, that's what they heard. So to me, it should have been my captain coming out. It shouldn't have been a peer-to-peer -peer type thing. It should have been my captain um, addressing emails. It should have been my captain going out to roll calls. It should have been more of a management philosophy rather than at a peer-to-peer -peer level. And then the officer reaction, we tried to introduce two things at once. We were trying to build a communication system on a SharePoint platform. So we were having the officers pull their randomizations off the computers at the same time that they were trying to implement hotspotting. And that just wasn't smart at all because we had two brand new ideas and they're trying to figure out which one's more important. And, and SharePoint went by the wayside. After about two weeks in the study, I just started printing out the randomizations and handing them out. It was much easier. If you wanted to incorporate this type of science into your policing agency, my suggestions are having a program manager that can identify what you're actually testing for. Because I think as cops, one of the things we do a lot is, well, we're just going to, my um, captain calls it the spaghetti test. We'll just throw a lot of strategies at a problem, and whatever sticks, we'll just keep. So you have to have somebody that could actually identify the question you're trying to answer and answer one question at a time rather than trying to answer a bunch of questions at the same time. You need the knowledge of your mapping systems and crime analysis. And then the ability to problem solve and work well within a team. For me, I, we all work within hierarchical organizations, which a lot of it means that you can't tell the person above you what you really think. And if you, <laughs> come on, you know that's what it means. Um, but in, in something like this, when you're trying to do a research design, you can't have that element in there because you can't, you can't have a team that won't speak honestly because what you'll have happen is 90 days into your study, there's going to be a fatal flaw in there and you're going to have results that are meaningless. And that's not what you want because you're spending your time, your effort, and your energy into creating this. So you need to have that kind of cohesive group that, that's able to communicate e with each other and talk about what you're trying to accomplish. And then a sufficiently t a large team to multitask because if you run this out of your crime analysis unit, they're still tasked with their other duties. So my department actually assigned me another sergeant and his major job was just to watch <coughs> Hotspot to make sure the officers were going out there to go problem solve. I think they actually gave me him because he was nicer than me. Mm -hmm. So every time there was a problem, he'd just go sweet talk them and bring them cookies where they got my email. Um, and then strong leadership, because it's not just about running the exper experiment. You actually have to strategize how you're going to roll it out. Right now, after our hotspot study, it's been put on hold because of our reorg and losing officers. But they're being very conscientious about how we roll this out to the whole entire city, so that way we get the maximum amount, amount of buy-in from the officers and the sergeants. Um, this is something that Dr. Weisberg already spoke to about the cultural um, change and the belief system about policing that it lies within our management to take on the philosophy. For me, once you show the benefit to executive management and they know what it, what it can bring to them, as that philosophy goes through the department, it should be something that's integrated into the academy. Because 
my feel is when we teach them in the academy, we send them out to FTO, it's about that third year on that they think, I know how to be a cop, I'm a badass, nobody can tell me what to do, and that's it for them, as, unless it's legal updates and some really cool training about bombs blowing up or canines or driving even faster than we already go. You know, they, their, their minds aren't open to that thing, to um, research. And then also incorporating it into your FTO program is that if you bring it into your academy that they take it out into the FTO program. My idea is you get them to do research, um, do a SARA model, have in their analysis that have a research base in there, and when then they go out to the FTO is see if they could actually incorporate it into their <coughs> FTO program. If they had a problem that they're working on is once they're out in the field to see if it really works. Also looking at um, cultural change, you need about 10 to 20 percent, I think, is the tipping point for changing a culture. So for me, I, I volunteered, I asked to teach in our in-service um, training, and my goal is we get about 25 to 30 officers every training, and my goal is to get seven of them to make eye contact with me. So I figure, <laughs> it's true though, come on, you guys know it. And so far, I've been pretty good. There's about average about seven of them that they want to see what the matrix is. They, they want to hear about the Cambridge program. They want to know why place-based policing is six times more effective. And I figure if I just keep getting seven of them, that eventually over time, I got 10 years left in my career, that maybe I'll get there. So this is my final slide, and just goes over why I think evidence-based policing is important. And it's things that have already been mentioned before is that we're getting our police agencies cut across the board in the nation, so we need, to, we need to be more effective using fewer resources, but we still have to reduce crime. It prevents wasted time, effort, and money. We all know that there's been programs that have been advocated by police chiefs that have no um, evidence backing them whatsoever, and we all take them up on a national basis and spend lots of money on them. I think it allows the officers to see what actually works out in the field because when you have them involved in a pilot study like that, they are the ones actually doing the work and then they could see the results. And then it gives you the scientific argument, argument against the media, city council and the public. Right now my chief is kind of facing our city council and they don't believe him because they're saying, well of course you're saying it works, you're the chief of police, you're going to say your type of policing works. And what he's trying to show is no, we're using research based policing. We're using the evidence that what's been proven to work and we're trying to integrate those practices within our police agency. So that is why you should give me more money and that is why you should give me more cops. And then probably the most important point is that it doesn't require a significant investment of funds. It just requires your willingness to be open to new ideas. Um, somebody that will take the lead in creating um, a pilot study and for us I don't know about other agencies, but we're very big on creating programs. So as an example I use, we created this program called SNAG, which actually received a multitude of awards. And what it was was a multi-agency approach to gang prevention. FBI, ATF, DEA, city, county, everybody that like touched our city was involved in this program. It was a two-day program and it was crackdown. So we went and knocked on every gang member, probationer, parolee's door, searched their houses. And we probably spent about a half a million dollars on police resources as far as employee time. And what we had to show for it was outputs. We showed about 43 arrests, um, some guns, a little bit of dope, um, things like that. And it was $500,000 two days, and we couldn't show conclusively that we had an effect in crime at all. My 90-day hotspot study, when I looked at the amount of time the hours spent on the hotspot hotspot study cost about $66,000 worth of police time, effort, and energy. And we reduced crime by 25%. So I think that pretty much speaks for itself. Yes? We're still, we're waiting for the 90-day buffer um, to go by because I want to compare apples to apples. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick with crime because we're gone. Because it's it's something you need to integrate into your patrol strategy, but because we just completely stopped it, it's kind of just going back to normal. <laughs>